Welcome everyone to our expert talk with Dr. Bernay and Dr. Dillon. We at the New York Academy of Sciences are excited to have a wonderful evening with you all. My name is Caitlin Green and I am the program manager of virtual programs in the education department here at the New York Academy of Sciences. Since 1817, the New York Academy of Sciences has been committed to advancing science for the benefit of society. With more than 20,000 members in 100 countries, the Academy advances scientific and technical knowledge and addresses global challenges with science-based solutions. We also organize a wide variety of educational initiatives at all levels for STEM and STEM-related fields. We are excited to continue our partnership with the Foundation of National Institutes of Health to present the 2022 Lori Prize Winners Expert Talk. Expert talks target young people and in particular middle and high school students in the Junior Academy and give students the opportunity to meet and ask questions to successful STEM professionals. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Alice Gianni, who will be our moderator this evening. Alice? A wonderful evening to everyone. I'm really happy and excited to have all of you part of this wonderful conversation. And as Kathleen said, today's expert talk will be, will be with Dr. Amberne and Dr. Andrew Dillon, who are the recent recipients of the 2022 Lourdes Prize in Biomedical Sciences, a prize that recognized the outstanding scientific achievements made by promising scientists who are aged 52 or younger. This virtual event is brought to you by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health in collaboration with the New York Academy of Sciences. Next, as a quick outline, after a brief introduction of the 2022 Lourdes Prize winners and their um, amazing discoveries, Dr. Amberney and Dr. Andrew Dilling, you will give us a presentation of their exciting and groundbreaking research focused on better understanding aging and longevity. That will be followed by a Q&A session where the audience will have a, the chance to ask questions and Dr. Ambernay and uh, Andrew Dilling uh, will be able to answer them. As a reminder for whoever in the audience would like to ask a question, you can do so by entering them into our chat box. Next. My name is Alice Gianni, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Well Cornell Medicine, where I work on neurodegenerative disorders. And I will be moderating this event, as well as the Q&A session that follows. Next. Next. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne Burney, who is the Michelle and Timothy Barakat Professor of Genetics at Stanford University. Her research is focused on using a unique multi-organismal approach to investigate the ability of enzymes to regulate the genes implicated in aging. She has identified several genes and many pathways critical for maintaining neural stem cells that may help preserve brain function during aging. It's also my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Dillon, who is a a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and the Thomas S. Stacey Siebel Distinguished Chair in Stem Cell Research at the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. His research has explored the ability of organisms to sustain a proper protein production processes, essential to maintain cellular structure and function in aging. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Amberne and Dr. Andrew Dilling to talk to us about the wonderful research and discoveries that they have made. It is a pleasure to have both of you as part of this conversation. Dr. Bernay, let's start with you. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. All right, thank you so much for this very nice introduction and good afternoon, everyone. My lab is interested in the mechanisms of aging and longevity, which is a topic that has fascinated both artists and scientists uh, over the years and many of us. 
Um, this is an example uh, of an art by Edvard Munch showing all the four stages of life. So where do I come from? I was born and raised in the French Alps. I then did my college in uh, Paris and then went to graduate school to get a PhD at the University of Nice in the south of France. I then crossed the ocean to gain further training during my postdoctoral work in uh, Boston at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Michael Greenberg. And then I set up my lab on aging and longevity at Stanford University back in 2004. So as I said, aging is really fascinated to all of us and to us scientists, it's fascinating because the function of virtually every organ in the body declines with age. And this is associated with generalized frailty at the end of life, and not just one, but many, many diseases, whether it's cancer, whether it's diabetes, and whether it's Alzheimer's disease, all of these diseases have, have age as their first risk factor. So this really raises the question of, can we understand the aging itself and could strategies that cause aging or reverse aspects of aging even, extend this healthy period of life without any diseases. Now, aging is very complex to study and our lab has set up to get at this complexity a multi-organismal approach using animals in the lab which have different lifespan. So short lifespans like the worm and the African turquoise killifish, because this really helps us do more experiments to get at the mechanisms of aging. And then organismal, organisms with longer lifespan like mice, cells from mice, cells from humans to have a more translational view on aging. So the key question we and many others have asked is how is aging regulated? What's this aging clock and how can it be influenced by environmental external stimuli? One of the best known one is dietary restriction. So restriction in food intake without malnutrition uh, extends lifespan and health. So how does it work and what are the general mechanisms of aging? Eric Greer was our first PhD student in the lab, and by using worm, what he found is what is called an epigenetic, quote unquote, regulation of aging. And what that means is that genes, you'll hear more of them from Dr. Dillon afterwards, and they can be packaged in uh, and inaccessible for transcription in closed chromatin, but they could also be open and uh, available for expression. And this is a regulatable process, a switch. And what Eric has found is that modulating those regulation that affect chromatin state open and close can actually extend lifespan in a long lasting manner. So this was very exciting to us. What we've also done is to develop the African killifish as a new model to study aging and age related diseases. Why this fish? because it's at a, at a sweet spot, if you wish. It's the shortest lived vertebrate. It lives only four to six months. So it's great for experiment and it's a vertebrate. And what that means is that unlike the worm, it has organs that are present in all vertebrates, including human, like an immune system, blood, stem cells in the tissues. And this is very important for human aging. So it's a great model for that. And Dario Valenzano, the fantastic postdoc who started this lab, this work uh, all the way back in 2006, together with other fantastic postdocs in the labs, what they did was to really build the, what's called the toolkit to make this animal interesting species into an animal that we can study in the laboratory. So they sequenced its entire genome and they developed a CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing pipeline in order to modify the genome of this fish. And the goal has been to test both genes and also epigenetic factors, like I mentioned, interventions like dietary restriction for their influence on aging. And then finally, 
were very excited about brain aging and rejuvenation in mammals using mice cells from mice cells from humans and were particularly focusing on the regenerative uh, region in the adult brain that contains stem cells. And what we've decided to do is characterize aging globally in the neurostem cell regenerative region of the brain, the chromatin states, this epigenetic regulation, gene expression, lipid metabolisms, lots of different aspects. And the goal is to identify strategies that can rejuvenate the stem cells and perhaps counter brain aging and age-related diseases like Alzheimer's. So the future of all this research is to really find ways to extend the healthy, disease-free portion of life. And we're very excited for the future. I want to close by thank, thanking an awesome team in our lab, like lots of uh, people interested in aging and our great collaborators. And I want to say that aging has been a really inspiring uh, field with a very inspiring and amazing colleague. And it's a real pleasure to share this prize with Dr. Andrew Dillon, uh, one of our amazing colleagues in the field. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernay, for the amazing presentation. And we look forward to knowing more about your research and your scientific journey in the Q&A uh, session that will follow. Now we will hear a bit more from Dr. Dillon. So Dr. Dillon, take it away. All right. Um, OK, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, so my voice is a little bit off. So please excuse that. But it's a pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about some of the research that Anna and I have been doing and um, working on aging and tell you some of the things that have been going on. Um, and so my name is Andrew Dillon. I'm at UC Berkeley. I'm a professor there in the immunology and molecular medicine division. And I'm also in the neuroscience division there. So I'm in a couple different divisions and it may become obvious um, why we work in a couple different systems because we're trying to understand like, and you know, the aging of different organ systems inside of an, of an entire animal. Um, so a little bit about myself. I grew up in Reno, Nevada. Uh, many of you have probably never been there. It's, uh, you know, the most Western city in, in uh, Nevada very small city. And from there, I went to college, actually, at the University of Nevada. Um, my family didn't have a lot of money, so I had to go where I could get the most scholarships and actually be able to go to college for free. So the University of Nevada is where I ended up. I started out as a physicist, quickly changed to become a chemist. And at the end, I ended up uh, getting a degree in biochemistry. And when we talk about heroes, there's uh, one person in particular that took me into her lab and showed me how the, to be a scientist, and that's Ardeth McCrack, and I can tell you a lot more stories about why she's a real hero um, a little bit later. But from there, I went to UC Berkeley, where I'm currently at, uh, to do my graduate work with Jasper Ryan and work on yeast genetics, which may seem a little bit obscure when we think about aging, but that may become obvious a little bit later. And after I finished my PhD with Jasper, I moved across the Bay and worked with Cynthia Kenyon, one of the pioneers, first pioneers, or the OGs of the aging research community over at UCSF and pioneered some of the work that we did there. And I first started off my career, my independent career, as an assistant professor at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California, which is this beautiful building here, um, until 2012. And then Berkeley recruited me back to come back to Berkeley and run my lab here. So I've been here uh, since then working on aging research. So um, as biologists, we wanna look at the exceptions and aging is, is no different than any other part of biology, is we wanna look at the exceptions and figure out why they're exceptional. And so this person here, uh, Jean Clement, is one of the oldest recorded humans. It's a little bit controversial about her actual uh, age, but nonetheless, there's many other people that are coming along there being over 120 years old, but she's one of the first. And it's remarkable. She wasn't just holding on to the last stages of her life. You know, if you look at her at age 70, she looks better than me, which I'm, I'm much younger than 70, but she's looking very good. And she lived 122 years and she was very healthy. She stopped smoking at age 117, rode her bike until she was 100. And there's if you go on and Google, there's some interesting stories about her and reverse mortgages and outliving the person that gave her a, a reverse mortgage, but we can talk about that more later. 
But this is really showing us that this is possible, that there is some plasticity in the aging process. And why is that? What's the underlying biology that she had that most of us will not have? How was she able to do this? So there's something inherent in her biology and her genetics that allow that to happen. So that's what we would really like to figure out. And I'm not claiming that we've done it. Um, we're just baby steps towards it, but we're, that's our goal is trying to figure this phenomena out. So if we think about aging really simply, you know, you're made up of over a trillion cells. And there's been a lot of research looking at aging of individual cells. So in the laboratory, we can work on yeast, which are individual cells, or we can isolate cells in culture and look at their lifespan. And from that, we've learned a lot of rules of what controls the aging of an individual cell. But when you take that to, for example, a human that's made out of a trillion different cells, are all those trillion different cells following the aging process in the same way? Or is there actually some form of coordination? And you can probably guess that there probably is coordination because we can look across the human population and we can see differences in aging that happen there um, across different people. And so the question is, do these rules exist you know, when we move into multicellular organisms? And is there coordination that's going to happen? And so that's this question here that we've been very interested in over the last 20 years is what happens when we move into you know, a multicellular organism such as C. elegans, the worm, which only has about a thousand cells and a human that has almost a trillion cells, how do they actually age? Is it stochastic? Is every cell determining its own age? Or is there actually gonna be some coordination that happens? And it turns out there's a tremendous amount of coordination that happens. And lots of work that Anne has done and I have done and many, many others in the, in the field have uncovered is that there's chromatin regulation of aging. And they set up these different states to determine the aging of different organs and organ systems to be coordinated. And that's pretty fascinating. But the question is, what is actually coordinating this? And to do this, as Anne mentioned, you know, we can't go into the human population and start doing aging studies there because that would be a hundred year experiment. And so we really do it, you know, in model organisms such as this worm, C. elegans, which only has around 959 cells and only lives about three weeks. So we can rapidly go through and learn basic principles of aging in it and see if they apply to the, to the human population. And what our lab has discovered is that aging is actually coordinated. And it's actually, there are master cell types in our body, such as the nervous system, that actually coordinates the aging process across the entire organism. And several pieces of work from our lab and others in the field have uncovered different signals that come out of the nervous system to tell the rest of the body how to perceive aging and actually how to deal with the stress of aging. And so some of these things are originating from mitochondria, signals that come from, I mean, we all know about mitochondria as being the powerhouse of the cells, but when they become dysfunctional in neurons, they tell the rest of the body about this. So the rest of the body can prepare for it. And they do that through a signaling molecule called a mitokine. We've also uncovered this for other parts of the cells, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, an ER kind, and there's also an HSR kind, which we can talk more about. Um, and so I would like to definitely move on and uh, try to address any questions you guys might have. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with Anne on this and the rest of the field. And I would be happy to continue on with this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Dillin and Dr. Embrony for the wonderful presentation and for sharing your fascinating research. So now I will start to ask some questions that were previously submitted by students. I also would like to remind that to the audience that uh, uh, we will answer your questions starting from about 6.20. So if you uh, would like to submit your question, you can do so by entering them into our chat box. So let's get started. And the first question we have get, got are about your research interests. So did you know that you wanted to become a scientist when you were in high school or even earlier? Uh, Alan, do you, yeah, do you wanna call on one of us or how, do, how would you like to coordinate this? Uh, okay, so uh, Andrew, Go first. <laughs> you I, mean, I, I wasn't volunteering, <laughs> but I'll be happy to. Um, yeah, so I didn't know what a scientist was when I was when I was growing up. My my family's 
were not scientists, so I didn't know exactly what being a scientist was. I knew that I liked science a lot, um, and my chemistry teacher really, you know, sort of took me by under his wing and helped me when I was in high school to become a better student. Um, but all I knew was that science usually meant you became an MD or a doctor. And it wasn't until I went to college and got to work in a lab and Ardeth McCracken really showed me what science was and the beauty of discovery. That's how I got into it. And I was totally hooked after that. I'll pass it on to Anne. Yeah, so very similar to Andrew. Um, uh, I, it's a teacher in high school, a biology teacher who uh, really inspired me to in science, into science, and then in college, like doing research in, a, in the laboratory. So a very similar path. And before that, no, I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist. Great. And as a follow up question, what experience did you have before your professional research that sparked your specific interest in aging and longevity research? And you can start first this time. Yeah, so uh, I guess in this case, unlike Andy, I didn't work on aging as a as a postdoc, um, but I was inspired by actually like the his PI Cynthia Kenyon's work and all the work from uh, the lab uh, that uh, that they did, and um, I was working on on something a little bit peripheral. But then when I started the lab, I thought, oh, this is so cool, this aging research. So I'll, try to start, start my lab among that and using the molecular handle that I had developed uh, as, a, as a postdoc doing something a little bit different, yeah. Wonderful, so your experience also shows that careers are really multidisciplinary and you start like from a specific topic and maybe you think your interests are in a certain direction and as you develop, like also your interests and your research will develop as well. So uh, Dr. Andrew Dilling, do you want to share your insights about what sparked your interest in this field? Yeah, so it was as a graduate student, I was trained as a geneticist. I was rigorously trained at UC Berkeley to think as a geneticist. And so when I finished my PhD, I wanted to really go after a really complex question. And I was thinking to myself, aging has got to be massively complex genetically. You know, you have these populations of people, some living short, some living a long time. There's going to be massive genetics behind it. Um, so I was intrigued with it, but I didn't think it was possible to actually approach it until Cynthia, my postdoc advisor, discovered a single gene that could double an animal's lifespan when it was altered. And that just, you know, it narrowed down the complexity tremendously so that we could apply classic gen genetics to it. And so that's what got me into it. And then being in it, and can attest to this as well, what I thought I was going to work on 20 years ago is completely different than what I work on now. It's that the field has evolved and there's so many interesting areas in it that I'm always having to rein reinvent myself and look at new areas of science. It's, it's truly fascinating to be in this field. Yeah, super interesting. So um, picking up on the last things you mentioned, so you mentioned about the interdisciplinarity of science. So uh, we also got a question like, did you benefit from something you learned outside of your field of expertise? And if so, from what field or discipline and how that has influenced your science? So Dr. Dilling, you can go ahead with this. Yeah, I think the, the number of, of, you know, of outside influences uh, you know, affect you tremendously as a scientist. If you're, you know, if you're just looking down at your one specific subject area and not looking at other subject areas, you're cutting yourself short. So you're always influenced by outside areas. And, you know, I am in the neuroscience group here at Berkeley, and I'm not, like Ann said, she she wasn't traditionally trained as an aging researcher. I was not trained as a, as a neuroscientist. But every question we address ends up in the nervous system. And so then I have to learn neuroscience and I'm very, you know, um, influenced by the neuroscientists here. And our, our work is evolving into immunology and so now I'm being heavily influenced by immunologists. So I think Pasteur said it best, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. And so you just have to be prepared for changes that happen. Always be flexible, I think, in your thinking. 
great. This is a very valuable advice for me and for everyone in the audience, I think. And do you want to add something and share like what uh, outside of your field expertise like you have found more influencing and benefiting the, your aging research? Yeah, one many aspects, of course. Um, and, but one aspect that I thought was really influential for us was the having an evolutionary angle to it and a comparative evolutionary angle to it. And, you know, this was a little bit inspired by the killifish living so short and comparing it to other species that live long. And then you have species also that live extremely long, uh, for example, the whale or that live 200 years, you know. So um, having the to think about like all those different species, comparing them, like understanding perhaps what could have uh, you know, evolved, lead, led to the evolution of short-lived versus long-lived species. That was uh, really cool and influential for, for our lab. Wow, wonderful. And we also got a question about what are your future research plan and what key questions or areas of study do you hope to focus on in your upcoming research, especially given this uh, interdisciplinarity and grow technological like growth in the recent years. So um, you can start. Yeah, so uh, one aspect, uh, we're interested in, in different things, of course, but one aspect that uh, at the moment we're interested in is to understand like how behavior changes with age uh, all along the lifespan, and then whether changes in behavior can even be predictive for how long uh, an organism has remaining to live and whether it's possible to influence general behavior and that could have an impact overall in, in, in trajectories, if you wish, of, of resilience or susceptibility to disease. Yeah. So that's one aspect that we're excited about. Very interesting. And what about you, Dr. Dillin? I'm going to collaborate with Anne. I'm just going to oh. work she works on. She always has the best ideas. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I think that the behavioral stuff is truly fascinating. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're really focused on is we've uncovered that, you know, the nervous system communicates the periphery to determine aging. But what we want to know is that does it actually affect diseases and is it actually associated with diseases? And, you know, if you can't do this communication, do you have disease X, Y or Z an uncharacterized disease that we don't know about? So we're very interested in doing that. And then we're really getting more mechanistic. Um, you know, what is actually being detected as damage in those neurons? You know, what is the actual event that's causing that? And, you know, can we learn more about that and apply that to human health? So those are, you know, the major things that we're, that we're trying to figure out right now. Yeah, and, very, and collaborating with Anne. If she very likes. fascinating. And tapping yeah. in these uh, um, disease and translational aspect uh, you mentioned. So do you think, are there any possible implications of your research and how might this research benefit human health in the long term? Do you want to start, Dr. Dillin? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I think that many of the discoveries we have are fundamentally basic discoveries in biology. And, you know, you, you never know when those are going to be drawn upon for human health. And so, you know, we're, we're building databases of discoveries that other researchers may be able to apply for disease X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, we do a, some of the stuff thinking that they're going to affect neurodegenerative diseases, but we don't know yet. Um, but the, I think the bigger question you're asking is, can we take what we've discovered right now and directly apply it to aging in humans? And I think that's a risky proposition. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done uh, to understand, you know, this is very early days, most of these discoveries in the aging field. And so we need to take them with a grain of salt and make sure that we're not going to make a mistake. Um, and also, I think Anne can speak to this tremendously. The heterogeneity that we have in the human population is going to be a huge variant when we look at aging and any age-related perturbations. You know, some may make people live long, some may actually make people live short. 
So um, I'm a little bit hesitant, but I think that we can learn just the basic findings that we found, apply them to some diseases. Yeah, so I mean, I would suck on everything Andy said. It's uh, said it very eloquently. Um, yeah, I think it's it's right now. It's early to it's early to say, and I, I also feel like the the field is trying to focus on on health, like this healthy, the fitness healthy portion of life, and trying to extend that aspect. Because what you wouldn't want to do is have like something translational, which might extend the overall lifespan, but in fact, also extend the, the decline like portion. So I think dissociating or like understanding the, the two different components, the lifespan, but also the, the fitness uh, portion of life, that's going to be very important for translational. And as Andy really said, like this, like very diversity of, of humans and their reaction to the intervention could be very different. So yeah, very important. Thank you very much. And tapping into human diversity, we also got a question if the aging process today is uh, different from what it was before. So how does today fast way of living affects process on the cellular level? So essentially is aging uh, in today world somehow and to what extent different from what it was like for a couple of generations ago? Yeah, Dr. Brené, you want okay. to? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a, another great question. Uh, in fact, the lifespan and the health span has drastically increased uh, from what it was before. And this is due to the advent of uh, clean water and also like all the advances in medicine, the antibiotics and all the great advances in medicine. So. So far, at least up until like a few years ago, the, the life expectancy was really rising, uh, raising and uh, like saying that probably we age less fast or like at least we can live longer than previous uh, generations. Now, uh, you know, due to perhaps like a bunch of different factors, stress might be one of them, pollution, um, you know, like other aspects like uh, pandemics and things like this, uh, it might taper off. So it'd be interesting to now really understand the key factors uh, in modern world, you know, that could lower or limit the health and lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, I have to completely agree with everything that Anne said. I mean, if you look several generations back, you know, the biggest change in lifespan happened with antibiotics, clean water, and better foods. Um, and so what is, you know, were the people living several generations ago, were they less stressed than the people, than us living now? I, I don't know. Um, you know, there may be, people may argue that it's more stressful to live now because there's so many other things going on, pulling our time in different directions. But it's hard to say and it's you know it's hard to actually predict you know is aging different now than it was then um i think the treatments the health treatments now greatly you know advance our lifespans yeah thank you so much and now changing maybe a bit gear to more like uh, what does it mean to be a scientist uh so um I, we received a question, what are your scientific heroes and role models? So scientists that you look at and that have inspired you and served as a model. And they can be like either, you know, your mentors or real people you interacted with or, you know, some, some scientists from the past or that you read in the newspaper, like that you really took as a model. So Dr. Dilling, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, one of my major heroes is Jacques Manot. Um, you know, what he did figuring out gene regulation was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but him as a person, I think, was more phenomenal. You know, he did this during World War II, all the things that he went through. And then he actually led the French people and the res resistance. I mean, it was, science was like a hobby to him. He had all these other things going on that were much more important. And he made all these massive discoveries. So just a tremendous person. Um, and then, as I alluded to, my very first mentor, Ardeth McCracken, I mean, she was, the story behind her is that she raised her four kids, they all went to college, and she said, she thought, hey, that looks pretty cool, I think I'll do that. 
And so, you know, in her early 50s, she went to college, got a PhD, and eventually got a, uh, a job as a professor and had a laboratory. And I happened to work with her. And it was just inspiring to see, you know, the challenge that she came over to actually become a scientist and a, and a role model and a great person. So those are my two. And I'll pass it on to Anne. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in terms of, you know, hero, I would say uh, Mary Slovetska Curie uh, for her, like, amazing dedication, like, you know, like everything she did was so inspir inspirational and how she led her life uh, as well. So I would say that. And then uh, in terms of uh, people who are <laughs> alive, um, yeah, all of my mentors, I felt that they were phenomenal grad school mentor, postdoctoral mentors in very complement complementary uh, ways uh, for their excitement for science and like, you know, their um, willingness to teach and, and inspire. And also like uh, Andy's uh, mentor uh, for, for uh, Cynthia Kenyon for the being an inspiration in the field of aging uh, for, uh, you know, not only people in, in her lab, but also people outside um, the, the lab, the general field, so yeah. Thank you so much. And this brings uh, an, another question we received from students. So how can we promote equity and excitement in STEM? Like aside from having these role models, like what other, you know, actions, what type of engagement like can be promoted? especially for the young scientists that are the majority of our audience today. So Dr. Anne Bernay, do you want to start with this? Yeah, so um, I think it's very important to have some sort of exposure, especially for people who didn't you know, see scientists in their family. So um, maybe like, you know, like having you know, just visiting maybe labs or having someone uh, who comes to the, the classroom or, or says, you know, or even like teach the teacher in the classroom teaching about discoveries in addition to facts, like how discoveries were made. Um, that's, I guess, one <laughs> idea. I'm sure there are many, many. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely add on to that. Um, I, I think that you know, from definitely from Anne's point of view, you know, with the students, you know, definitely go for experiences out there. If it looks kind of odd to you, definitely go and get the experience, you know, see, learn about it. Don't close any doors. But I think from our point of view, Anne's and I and other, you know, professors and things like that, you know, what we need to do better and more of is we need to use diverse examples, you know, when we're teaching. Um, you know, we need to not use our own experiences because they're very different, you know, try to use student experiences and how they actually see these, see this and, you know, really center it around the student and their learning objectives. Um, you know, it's too many times we bring our own personal views into this. And I think that that, you know, is not the best example in the way to actually create excitement in this in STEM. Yeah, and do you have any comments about the equity part of the question? So how can uh, um, be promoted equity in, uh, in STEM? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, the, the equity part of it is, you know, creating more diverse examples in our teachings and also using examples other than our own to get actually get this up and yeah. running. Um, but reaching out to under underrepresented minorities and groups of that nature and getting them more involved into into the laboratory you know creating programs summer programs that are focused towards bringing in underrepresented minorities get them the first experience in the labs and have them actually do research and we can do this we do it at berkeley you know we have high school students coming in spend summers with us we have college students come in and spend some summers with us and specifically going into uh, communities where science is not necessarily represented. Yeah, thank you very much. And now I have a question for Dr. Bernay. So can you talk about your experience as a female scientist and um, any challenges you have overcome as a woman in STEM? Yeah, sure. So, uh... Well, uh, science is sometimes viewed as traditionally like masculine, although it's changing at a very, very rapid pace. Um, what, I mean, 
you know, like I sort of like feel that every challenge can also be uh, an opportunity to learn and things like this. So my what I've always tried to do and try to encourage women in my lab to do is to to be yourself and to try to sort of like realize that there is not just this one path and like it's the only path that, you know, you can, um, you know, as long as you're excited about it and you just put your mind to it. I, I mean, it's more complicated than that. Probably there are barriers that are that could be systemics. But I think the the first aspect would be to to kind of do it the way you want you want it to do. So that's what I try to encourage women in my lab to do. Of course, there are other like uh, aspects that are problematic. But yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And more generally speaking about challenges, like uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Andrew Dillon. So how do you overcome challenges now? And what have you learned while overcoming challenges? This is a great question. I mean, this is almost like a life question, not just a science question. <laughs> um, so with the big challenges, what I do, I used to freak out and think I'd have to get it all figured out all at once. And that was driving me crazy, you know, because I couldn't do it. And so what I learned is that, you know, with the big challenges I have in front of me is I tick away at it day by day. And then eventually you get over that. And it just takes time and patience to do that. And I'm not a horribly patient person, but I had to learn how to do that. Um, but when there's a lot of small challenges, I organize myself to take on the most important ones first and then go down the list, actually create a list and go through it. So that's sort of my way take of dealing with this. And I don't know if Anne, if you have a different, I would love to learn it if you have a different way of getting over challenges. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm glad to uh, learn your tricks. <laughs> and, uh, mine are actually like uh, very similar, like break down into smaller things to have the ability to bite into, into the bigger, bigger problem. And then when there are like many of those, like really learn to prioritize if it, if even, even if it's just one, one in one day is better than you know like trying to do many and not so that's uh that's how i do i do i try to do it <laughs> that's always the best uh at it but yeah thank you very much for sharing your insight into the importance of being organized and breaking down the challenges don't look at the mountain but breaking down to pieces that you can actually chunk every day and I think another challenge in science and I think in every type of profession is also like how do you manage the like to balance your time effectively to maintain a work-life balance? So uh, Dr. Amberney, can you start with that? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> one thing I try to do is to uh, not try to to view it on a on a day to day basis because sometimes it gets like crazy and hard to do that. So I try to view it in the grand scale thing. So sometimes there are moments <laughs> where there is a lot that needs to be done. You know, like there is a paper, there is something to a fellowship to write, like something. So then, of course, the <laughs> it's going to be more work. And then, you know, when that's done, it's very important to refresh. It's like, you know, sleeping at night and being active in the day. You have those big periods of work and then you want to, you know, rejuvenate, uh, take, uh, take some time off, do something else altogether. And then when you come back, you're re-energized. So I try to view it on the on the long scale rather than on an everyday basis. Thank you very much for the insights. And Dr. Andrew Dillon, any other advice? I love Anne's approach. I think her and I think exactly the same way as that there's in this career, there's periods of massively hard work and then there's downtimes. And so you really take advantage of the downtimes when you can. Um, the other great work work balances is you know surrounding your yourself with great people so that they're taking on some of the hard 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 work and the other thing as a scientist and probably Anne can say this as well is that you start thinking about science the moment you wake up and the moment you go to sleep it's always on your head you know there's no way to get away from it you're always thinking about it um and it's just how you deal you compartmentalize that so that you can enjoy other things but I mean, we enjoy thinking about science and when there's a problem, we're gonna keep thinking about it until we find a solution. It's just the way we're hardwired. 
Yeah, thank, thank you very much for your advice. And another question we got from the student is uh, more generally, what is your advice for young scientists just starting out on their journeys, on their STEM journeys? Uh, is that for me first? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. I, I think we talked a little bit about this is, you know, go and ex try new experiences um, and never, ever stop asking questions. Um, there is not a stupid question. You know, if someone push, put you off because of your question, go and ask somebody else. Um, you know, always keep asking and don't be afraid to ask. I think that's one of the things we see is that when students stop asking questions, they've stopped being engaged and they're not following the process anymore. Just keep asking questions and find people to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much. Anne, any insights on that? Yeah, the, this is a great from, uh, advice from Andy. Um, yeah, um, I would say like, yeah, try to find something like a lab, like experience different um, labs if one can. And I think like now with those summer program, it's possible to really try to find something that you're passionate about. Everyone is different. So I think like the an important aspect is to try something, is to try different things to see like which one is the most exciting to one and then once one has found that to keep going <laughs> try to keep going even when it gets tough it always gets tough so it's this roller coaster a little bit and one has to kind of like it's it's an inherent inherent part of it so the, there are some lows and there are some highs and it's to keep pushing when the lows are low so that you know it will eventually for sure come out uh, as a as a high so yeah try to find something fun and keep persevering through it Thank you so much. We also hear very frequently about the importance of mentors in science. So do you have any advice like how to identify a mentor, how to approach a mentor, like what worked for you when you were a student and like now that you are on the other side, like what you look in, you know, in a great student that wants to start like in your lab doing a rotation doing an inter internship so and do you want to start with that yeah i think for finding a mentor i think it's important to try to find someone who wants to be a mentor so try to identify people who you know like they pay attention to like you know they come to your poster if you're presenting a summer poster like people who would uh, are naturally interesting. You cannot really force it. So it's good that the, the person is interesting, interested in you to begin with. And uh, find someone who fits your style. Like uh, again, everyone is different. And then there are many, many, many different types of mentors. And you, know, you need to find one that fits your style and maybe several in fact that fit your style and can teach you in different directions. Yeah, I think that's the key is that there's different styles for different people. And, and so, you know, cast your net widely. Um, you know, if you're a student at school, you know, you're, you're very interested in science and definitely going to go talk to your science teachers. But, you know, your English teacher may actually have some very good points for you as well and mentoring points for you as well as making it through college and things like that. So, you know, don't disregard the people outside of your field because you can get, you know, some of the best advice I've gotten have been from people outside of my field and how to approach questions. So be open-minded. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, now we, we would like uh, to turn to some questions that uh, have been submitted from the audience. So the first one is a very interesting, is a bit about fake news or misconception. And it is, what are the biggest misconceptions the public has about aging? <laughs> So, Dr. Dillin, do you want to start yeah. answering this? Um, I mean, there is a lot of talk about, you know, different supplements and different things that can change your aging um, from studies that have been done in model organisms such as yeast and worms and mice. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest, I think the biggest misconception that that has is that, yes, those experiments have worked in these very confined very sterile environments where we're controlling every variable. Um, but when you go out on the streets in the human population, 
you know, it's very different than what's happening in the laboratory. And so will these things work, you know, out in the human population? I don't know. Um, it's a big leap to make those, those you know, to, it's a big leap to make that happen. So I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that's happening in the field. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. And do you have something to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree completely with what Andy is saying. Also, like sometimes, you know, like uh, in terms of things that gets uh, that perhaps like people like are thinking, oh, is that true or not? Like this idea of reversal of aging <laughs> and this kind of a big word, can aging be reversed? <laughs> um, and it's probably aspects of aging that can you know, get better but in the end you know there is a clock ticking so I think like what we uh like the re complete reversal like Benjamin Button style is probably like but I think it's nice to think about it and emulate it but you know it could lead to misconceptions yeah thank you very much for for pointing out these misconceptions uh, and uh, yeah and kind of fake news in science we also received a general question, which is about science communication. So how did you learn to translate complex science so that anyone can get excited about their, your science? And do you have any tips for others when communicating their science? So um, if you want to start with this. Yeah, well, I think... Uh with aging it's actually kind of neat because I think we can all relate to it even when one is uh, relatively young they can see their parents or their grandparents so it's it's a relatable field so for general communication that's quite helpful uh, otherwise in terms of tips I try to always think about like how like to to explain uh, without using too much jar jargon like field specific jargon so without like you know words that could be you know like not uh, that could be very like special to the to the field so that's what I tried to do. Yeah, I think those are good 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 tips. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that really helps is just talking all the time. Um, you know, I always encourage my students to go home and, you know, tell their roommates about their science. Um, you know, one of the things I always like to think about is me trying to tell my mother, who's not a scientist, what I do um, so that she can understand it. And so if she can understand it, then the general public can. Um, one of the great things that Anna and I have is we both teach. And teaching is probably the best way to learn how to get concepts across is you know you have 800 students and you only have 45 minutes to get a concept across you really have to become organized and learn how to get those thoughts across so if you can teach <laughs> teaching is the best way to do it yeah thank you very much yeah these are great suggestions so communicate like your science or what you are learning in class like uh, to your family, to your friends, to whoever, and keep practicing. Yeah, that, that's that's a great suggestion. We also got a question um, about your like um, how to become a scientist. So I am a high school student, and my dream is to become a scientist, but that's kind of difficult in my country. What could be my first step to pursue this journey? And I think that relates also partly to what mentioned at the beginning, like you also had no scientist in a family. You also discovered to, that you wanted to become a scientist like in, in college or in high school. So yeah, what are your suggestions to, to high school students? Dr. Andrew Dilling, do you want to? Yeah, this something? is a great, this is a really fantastic question. Um, and I'm, you know, I was thinking about it while you're, while you're saying it is, um, you know, we, that question can be broken down in a couple of different ways is that I really want to become a scientist. Um, I really want to become a biologist, but where I'm at, there's not a lot of biology. And so, you know, you may have to go and do some other form of science to really get engaged in the scientific process. Um, that's one way that you could do it if that's the challenge that's happening. If the challenge that's happening that in your country there is no opportunities for you to actually do science for one reason or another, I would look for, and Anne can probably speak better to this, abroad opportunities. And there are opportunities to bring students over for summer or for a year to do programs 
in Canada, the United States. Um, so I think that's the other option that I can think of. Dan? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so I feel like the, the programs, there are programs that, um, summer programs for high school students that are relatively international and can take students from other different countries. Several universities, many universities, in fact, have them all over the world. So it's a, it's a matter of trying to find this information, probably like, you know, Google is a first great step into that. Um, but yeah, I think like summer, summer high school programs would be a, a great way to start. One can try sometimes, you know, that happens like cold emailing PIs. Um, it's a little bit hard sometimes because of course, you know, like experience leads to more experiences, uh, uh, opens up uh, experiences, and it's hard to get the very first one. Um, and that's why those summer, uh, summer programs are so valuable. Yeah, thank you very much. And we have uh, time for the last question. So are the so-called project ride syndrome true models of accelerated normal aging? Um, and um, do you want to start answering this? Yeah, so there are those models, um, you know, uh, that model disease in humans that look like accelerated aging and they are called in, in, uh, in the jargon, <laughs> segmental aging progeria, meaning that they recapitulate segments, like aspects of the aging process, but not all of them. So in the laboratory, they are very helpful in the sense that, you know, because they are relatively short-lived and exhibit signs of aging very fast, one can use them as a, as a nice first tool to understand what is going on and how to, uh, you know, change that. Um, but it's important also to remember that they, are, they don't represent all aspects of aging and what works in them and not work during normal, normal, during physiological aging, I guess, and vice, and vice versa. So they are a great tool, uh, probably not the all, whole answer. Yep. No, that is exactly right, is that there are many different inputs into the aging process. One of them is DNA damage, is how well your genome is actually maintained. And a lot of these progeroid models, they affect how the genome is actually, how it's damaged or not. And so they're very good for picking up that aspect of aging. But if you want to look at some other aspect of aging, you know, how your mitochondria are doing, it's probably not a good model. Um, so it just depends on the question you're asking. Is it? There's a lot of things that input aging, and that's what's so exciting about it. There's many different areas of biology. Thank you very much. Maybe we have time for one other question then. So do you have an interest in how the endocrine system connects to the nervous system? Is this an aspect like that relates to aging, Dr. Dilly? Yes, 100% <laughs> correct. The endocrine system plays a, a massively important role in aging. And actually, if you go back decades, some of the first long-lived mice, the snow, dwarf mice or the Ames dwarf mice are long lived because they had a disruption in their IGF-1 growth hormone signaling axis, which is the endocrine, part of the endocrine axis. And so it plays a pivotal role in many of the things that my lab studies is endocrine related as well. So whoever asked that question, very excited to meet you. You're right on target. <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> And something to add to that is your laboratory also interested in this connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system? Yeah, um, not as much as Andy, of course, but you know, using the killerfish, we started to get interested in, in neuropeptides in there and they because they regulate behavior, that was our primary interest into them. But of course, they also are very important for the neuroendocrine system. So it's kind of neat to see how they could couple different behaviors, but also the hormonal system um, together with the, using the killerfish as a model, yeah. 
Thank you so much. So it's uh, 6 30, and I think that's all the time that we have for questions. So I want to say a huge thank you to you, Dr. Ambourne, and Dr. Andrew Dilling, for presenting today and sharing with us your wonderful research. I also would like to thank our active and very engaged audience. There are more than 15 questions that I did not have a chance to ask. So thank you for your participation. And just a reminder, we will post a recording of this talk. And with this, I would like to wish you a wonderful rest of the day. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have a good you. evening. Study hard. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.